Do you find yourself in a hopeless situation at home? If you're one of our guests today, I'm preaching through a series of messages through the book of 1 Peter, a book that is written to suffering Christians, and Peter is trying to encourage them to have hope. Many of them find themselves in a hopeless situation. And he establishes that hope based on the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and that the world is offering a hope that is not living, it is dead. It provides no hope. But the hope that we have is a living hope based on Jesus Christ. So we've gone from that point in 1 Peter to some practical applications of that hope. Where does that hope apply to us in the way in which we live? We see that it helps us in our relationship to the government. It helps us in our relationship where we work, in the employee-employer relationship. And we find that it also provides hope at home. Now, last Sunday, I started a two-part sermon on this very issue of finding or how to have hope at home. And if you remember, we talked about, uh, ladies, how to have hope with your husbands. And especially if you're living with a husband who is an unbeliever or he's not growing in his faith. And how do you relate to him? And so, ladies, turnabout's fair play, right? So today, we're going to talk to the guys. And if you will, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to just review the, the passage for just a moment and highlight last Sunday just the brief points that I made there to give context to what I want to share with our men today. Here Peter writes, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if some disobey the Christian message, they may be won over without a message by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Your beauty should not consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold ornaments or fine clothes. Instead, it should consist of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very valuable in God's eyes. For in the past, the holy women who hoped in God also beautified themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do good and aren't frightened by anything alarming. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives with understanding of their weaker nature, yet showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, ladies, last week we talked about how to have hope at home, follow the leadership of your husband. That begins with a submissive lifestyle, understanding his role and your role. It's not a matter of equality. I'll get to that, in fact, in the passage today, uh, more of what that really means. But following the leadership of your husband and, and, and submitting to him, and we talked about that most of the time a couple will come to an agreement in the relationship about a decision. Uh, and, 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 and most of the time, 95, 98% of the time, in a healthy marriage, the two will come to an understanding that this is the way we should go. But when you're in that position where the husband has an opinion and the wife has an opinion, somebody has to make the decision. And I mentioned last Sunday, you don't flip a coin. We don't bet on the ferry on these kind of things because they are eternal decisions that you're making. And so there's a formation for battle to assure victory in the home that God has given. And that is with someone leading and someone following when that has to come into play. And so that's where the, the, the message really hits home to us and to you ladies of knowing how to adapt and adjust to your husband as he is to lead. And men, I'll talk to you about how to do that in just a moment. So submissive lifestyle, we talked about a godly behavior. He talks about winning them over. This is why you're living this way. And really the play on words is that here is a man who doesn't obey the message, and you're going to win him over without a message. You're not going to win him over by speech. You're not going to win him over by nagging him to do something spiritual, to become a Christian, or to take that next step that he needs to take in his spiritual life. The way in which you do it is with a, a, a godly behavior. And notice, he says, with a gentle and quiet spirit, which we'll get to in a few moments in the in the godly attitude, in your inward beauty. It's not the outward beauty that he's concerned about that you ought to be concerned about. It's the inward beauty. Remember I said last week that there are attractive women who become very ugly to their husbands because of the attitude of their heart, because they don't have godly behavior. They, they're, their focus 
uh, not on the inward beauty, but on the outward beauty. Nothing wrong with looking nice. If you weren't here last Sunday, don't take that out of context. There's no, he's not faulting that. He's just saying, where's the focus? You're out of balance. And then he said, the way that you're following your leader, the leadership of your husband is trusting God. He said, your hope is in God. Men, the women of the past, they hoped in God. And that's really the key to the entire text, ladies, is for you to place your hope in God. You are following God's leadership as you're following your husband's leadership. Hopefully, he's following the Lord Jesus Christ. If he's not, you'll win him over by living a gentle and quiet spirit, a godly life. Uh, hopefully, that will motivate him to see Christ in you and follow God in his life. Now, men, let's talk about what we're to do, finding hope in the home, and that is pursue the needs of of your wife. Let's review verse 7 again. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives with understanding of their weaker nature, yet showing them honor as co heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, again, you'll notice there's only one verse that Peter gives to the men, several verses to the women because they need it. I mean, because they. Here's what he's saying. Remember? Wives tend to be the suffer sufferers in the home. He's writing to suffering Christians. The employee tends to suffer more than the employer. The employer has his problems. But in an unhealthy context, the employee is the one who suffers because he's submitting to the leadership of the employer. The citizen is the one who tends to suffer in the government. The government doesn't. It's the citizen who tends to suffer. And in the home, especially in a home where the husband is not following God, that the woman is the one, the wife is the one who tends to suffer. But he does speak to the husband. And notice he says, in the same way. In the same way, or likewise. Now, he's talking about the wife submitting. He's not saying, men, you need to submit. That wouldn't work. I mean, he would be saying just the opposite, really, uh, of what he's trying to communicate. As he has addressed women... In the same way, he's going to address men. In the same way that he addressed citizens, he addressed, uh, he's addressing men, or etc. All right? So he's just saying, I need to speak to the men about this issue. So how do I pursue, as a man, as a husband, how do I pursue the needs of my wife? There's two things he's basically saying. Those, first of all, men, that we're to understand our wives. And he describes our wives as being a weaker vessel. So that means that we understand her physical needs. That's all that he's mean by that. He's not saying that she's weaker physic, uh, emotionally, spiritually, uh, mentally. She's not inferior intellectually at all. He's saying that she's just weaker physically and we need to be sensitive to them. Now why is he saying that? Because it is counter to the pagan culture and to their understanding of their wives being a weaker vessel, meaning that they were being taken advantage of as being a weaker vessel, being less physical. In other words, what he's communicating is they, that Christian men are not to be abusive. The unchristian men, the pagans of that culture, were abusive to their women. They were a, nothing but a piece of property. That's all that they were in that culture in that day and time. Again, Jesus liberated women. He brought value to women. He elevated women. And the writers of the New Testament do that. They don't show a lower view of women. They show a higher view of women. Jesus on the cross shows a higher view of women by the way in which he wanted to make sure to John, speaking to John, you take care of my mother. You make sure that you take care of her. And so a, a husband is not to be abusive to his wife. Her rights are not re reduced. Her status is not reduced. She's not a slave in the home. And a man is not to be adding burdens to a woman because she, uh, uh, she's just there doing what he wants her to do. He's to be sensitive to her. So here Peter is countering the pagan culture, making them understand that she's a weaker vessel. Therefore, you need to take care of her needs. The needs that she has are things that she cannot do that you need to be doing as a man in the home. He's also speaking to her emotional needs. That whenever she's a weaker vessel, it doesn't mean she's weak emotionally, but part of understanding my wife is understanding her emotional needs. Guys, you'll never understand your wife. That's not going to happen. But we're to pursue understanding her. Just because there are things about her that I'm not going to understand, she thinks differently than you and I think. 
But that doesn't negate the responsibility that I have of pursuing her needs. Now, ladies, one of the ways that you can help your husbands, because we're thick-headed, we don't get it. Don't play a mind game with your husband by saying this, if he loved me, he would know what to do. Well, in most homes, your husband does love you, but he doesn't know. Now, guys, there are things we should know just automatically to do, like saying I love you and, and helping her and some simple basic things that it's amazing how many guys just don't do the basic things, the things we ought to know. But if there's a need, here's my point, ladies, that a man is not meeting in your life, you need to tell him. And guys, the way you pursue the needs of your wife is taking her out on a date, doesn't have to be expensive, sitting at the table, and, 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 or, or going somewhere, and, and there hasn't been a blow up. That's not the time to ask what her needs are, because she's not going to say it in the way you want to hear it. You want to be in a position where everything's going well, and you just say, honey, where am I missing it? What are some needs in your life that you have that I, I need to help you with and help, help meet those needs? And, and guys, she'll tell you. You know, she'll say, well, the other day this happened, and this is where you can help me. And ladies, this is just a great opportunity when your husband opens that door. Don't blow him away with your ammunition, all right? Don't be saying, fire in the hole, fire in the hole, when, when he begins to say, how can I help you? Just, just, just in a godly, quiet, gentle spirit way, as he's already referred to, say, this would really help me. And most times, most of the time, a guy's going to get that. He's going to understand, okay, here's a need. And the way you say it is going to make him respond in a better way, in a quicker way to you. Guys, the way we also help her emotionally and pursuing her needs emotionally is encouraging her. Women need encouragement. Now, ladies, guys need encouragement because they're discouraged all the time where they work, most of the time. But, guys, we need to be encouraging our, our women, our wives, helping them understand how much we value them that we need to help them and we need to affirm them in the things that they're doing for us because they often feel like what they do is a thankless job. We take them for granted. I, I often tell couples, and I often say this in a marriage, I'll be doing one uh, a week from Saturday, that the day that, that a couple stands here is the day that, that they begin to take each other for granted. They've worked so hard to, to, to be presentable to each other, to uh, say things to each other, write notes to each other, go on dates, all those things leading up to the wedding. For some reason, it just falls off the cliff after the wedding. Where we still need to be dating our wives, we still need to be pursuing our wives, we still need to be affirming them and encouraging them and making sure that they know how much we love them. Listen, that will encourage them emotionally. That's speaking into them, and that will, that will help the marriage. But also, guys... The way that we live with our wives in an understanding way is understanding their spiritual needs. And the main thing that I want to say here, the most important point that I want to make to us guys today is that if you're the spiritual leader of the home, then lead. If you're the leader of the home, then lead. Now, if we look in Scripture, we're going to find that Jesus led in three specific ways. He set direction all through his life. What did he say? Follow me. Jesus set direction. He said, here's where I'm going. I know where I'm going, and I want you to follow me. Secondly, he provided protection to those around him. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Third, he made provision. I have come that you might have life and, hand, and have it more abundantly. Guys, Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to us as men, says the same thing. Remember, Ephesians 5 is really not about marriage. It's a theological statement about us and the church, the believers and church. The illustration Paul uses is uh, the, the marriage relationship. But really he's making a statement about the value of the church and, and the believers in this relationship to, to, uh, to Jesus Christ. That's why when we talk about the role of the husband and the wife, it's not about an ancient culture. It's transcultural because Peter appeals... Paul appealed to uh, an issue that was from the very beginning, the relationship of a husband and wife, and really about a greater picture, us and the church. But what is Ephesians 5 showing? 
First of all, a man sets direction. The husband is the head of the wife. He leads the wife. What is a man saying? He ought to be saying, follow me. Why? Because I'm following Jesus Christ. I don't know where I'm going, but I know where he's going. And wherever Christ is going, it's going to be good for our family. If this is what the Lord Jesus wants of me and wants of us, then it's going to help us as a family. So when you have a husband who is leading and he's following Jesus Christ, he's setting the direction for your home. And men, that's what our ladies want. That's what they need. They want a man who is leading them and leading them to a place that's going to be good, a place that is healthy. They're scared to death because they don't know where we're leading them. And, and we have a great opportunity to help our wives and, and, and speak truth into them and, and meet their needs by leading them. Secondly, a man provides protection. The Bible speaks in Ephesians 5 of the fact that he should protect his wife so she has no stain. That means she is blameless. Adam allowed his wife to be stained and blamed in the garden. What did he say when God came to him? Did you do what I told you not to do? Hey, the wife, she made me do it. He put the blame on her. That woman you gave me. That's the way he said it. That woman you gave me. Oh, see, now he assumes responsibility that God gave him the woman, but now he's putting the blame really on God. It's God's fault that that happened. So, guys, we provide protection. I'll go back to that in a minute. A man makes provision. Ephesians 5 says he provides and cares for his wife. So, guys, we need to assume the responsibility of leading our wives because that will help meet the spiritual needs of their life. We also, men, need to stay connected to God. If we're going to be leading our wives and living with them in an understanding way, we need to be connected to God. The closer we are to God, the closer we're going to be to our wives. I have found time and time again that the guy who's having problems in his home, most of the time, if the guy's the issue, it's because he's not connected to God. He's cut back on his time alone with God. He's cut back on his prayer time. He's cut back on studying God's Word. He's cut back on, on being with God's people. You just watch a man, and when he begins to start backing away from those basic responsibilities, trouble will enter the home. So guys, we assume responsibility by leading our family, staying connected to God. We communicate spiritual truth. And not just communicate it, but we live that truth before them. We live that truth before them. You know, again, I grew up in a pastor's home. The thing that I value about my dad, he never said, you're doing this because you're a pastor's son. You're doing this because this is what Christians do. This is what the Bible says that we do. And in your home, that's what you're saying to your children. That's what you're saying. You're creating a culture of, of Christianity in your home where we're doing these things because this is what the Scripture teaches. And yes, I know this is what the culture is saying we shouldn't do. But Dad, everybody else, all the rest. And that's where you as a dad lead because you're not a friend to your child. You're a parent to your child. And a child needs to be led. Oh, they're going to fuss and carry on. And, and, and they're not going to want to do the things that, that we're suggesting that they do. But you do it in a, in a careful way. In a careful way. There's a way to do that. Milestone strategy is going to help you as parents learn how to do that in a careful way. But give direction. You're leading your family in that way. So, we live with our wives in an understanding way. Listen, well, this, is what, this is what Peter's really saying. Guys, if we're not living with our lives in an understanding way or according to knowledge, we're living with them in ignorance. It's one or the other. Either I understand my wife or I'm ignorant of my wife. And that's how a lot of ladies feel. They just feel this guy has no clue who I am or the way in which I think or what will help me. And it's because we just don't take the time to ask some simple questions. How can I help you? Because, guys, let's be honest. A lot of times we think it's about us. They really are here to take care of me and just to do what I want them to do rather than seeing if I'm meeting their needs, then they're going to meet my needs. Boy, I tell you, the best piece of advice I got before I got married was from my college minister. 
we had lunch one day, and, and he knew Karen real well and, 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 and myself. And it was just Ron and I. And he said, Mark, I know you're getting married in August. This was toward the end of my last semester of school. And he said, I just want to give you a piece of advice, Mark. It's so simple. But he said, man, I'm going to tell you, I promise you it'll work. If you focus on making her happy, more than likely she's going to make you happy. And what he was really saying was this passage in 1 Peter 3, verse 7. If you live with your wife in an understanding way, most of the time it works out. Now, guys, a wife's response is irrelevant to your responsibility. She may not buy into it. See, the, the coin could be flipped. She's not where she should be spiritually. You may be living with an unbelieving wife or wife who's not growing in her relationship. But the way you're going to win her over is by living with her in an understanding way, not an ignorant way. Because here's what happens. In ignorance leads to insecurity in your life as a man. If I don't know what to do, I become very insecure. And when I become insecure, I don't do anything. I become passive. And when I become passive, that leads to destruction. So given the options, what I want to do? I want to live with understanding so that I'm active, I'm leading. And that gives security in the home. And when that, give, when that security is there, it brings blessing. It brings life, not death, to the home. All right, the second thing he says is to respect your wife. Understand your wife. Number two, respect your wife. He says, first of all, showing them honor. The word honor there is used in two ways in the language of the New Testament. It means that something is very costly. If you're buying something for someone, the, the more important they are, usually the more costly the gift. It also means position, that this person is a person of honor because of the position that they hold. So what is he saying about your wives? I live with them in honor. I see this person as priceless. And I see this person of high value. They have a high position in my life, not a low position in my life. I value them. I place them above myself. As Jesus said, again, I'm providing protection. I'm laying down my life for the sheep. And the wife is in your home. I'm leading as the shepherd of my home. So I'm going to lay down my life for her. I'm showing her honor. We do that privately. You honor her in front of the kids. You do not dishonor her in front of the kids. Man, this is where a lot of train wrecks happen right here. A wife feels humiliated and defeated because a husband has made fun of her in front of the kids or humiliated her. Now, there's balance there. I know that every now and then it's okay to kid. Don't get legalistic on me here. But, but you, guys, you know what I mean. And, and listen, ask your wives if you've embarrassed them in front of the children. They'll tell you. Oh, yeah, the other day you said this and did this. That embarrassed me. Or in front of your parents or her parents, talking down about her, trying to humor so you can look better in their eyes. It, it just creates problems in the home. That's dishonoring our wives. He says, show them honor privately and publicly. Also notice he says that we live with them as co-heirs of the grace of life. She may be weaker physically, but she's on equal ground spiritually in her position with Christ as I said last Sunday women are equal with men and this was a very unusual word to be used this is unusual language to be used in that day and time in fact it was absolutely radical for Peter to say that this woman is a co-heir with the man so again he's elevating this woman in her status so what does it mean co-heir it means that we have the same thing we share the same thing. So what is a man and a husband, I mean a man and a wife in a Christian marriage, what do they share? You share the same relationship with God. You share the same destiny. You're trying to get to the same place together as a team. She shares in equal value the destiny that you share. You share the same inheritance. What is it? God's grace. The grace of life, the grace that gives life. And you share everything about our spiritual lives, or everything about our spiritual lives is equally shared together. Everything that you're trying to do together as a couple, centered in Christ, 
is to be equally shared. Now, why is this so important? Now, guys, here's the key to the passage for you and for me. These few words. So that your prayers will not be hindered. Peter has one verse for the guys. And this one phrase in this one verse is the power punch. This is where the ship sails or the ship sinks. Because if a guy is mistreating his wife, is a guy, if a guy is creating problems with his wife and they're at odds, he says, your prayers don't get above this ceiling. God can hear the prayer, but God's not going to respond to your prayer. Now listen, guys, you and, I, you and I have too much at stake for our prayers to be hindered. The word hindered there means an obstacle is thrown in the way, where it's tripped up. It's, it hinders me, it stops me. And my prayers are being hindered. It's, it, there, there, it's, the way we're treating our wives, it's, that's an obstacle to our prayers. And you and I have too much at stake. In this culture that we live in, trying to rear a godly family is almost impossible. Nothing's impossible with God. But in order to do it, we've got to live with our wives in an understanding way, treat them as a weaker vessel, honoring them so that our prayers will not be hindered. Here's the bottom line. Men, we lead. Ladies, you respond to that leadership by following your husbands in a healthy context, in a way that glorifies God. Now, I want to close today, not with a, a story so much, but with a Bible story. And guys, I really want to help you. And here's where you can evaluate where you are as a man in your home. In Judges chapter 7, we find the story of Gideon. Saturday night, I had the opportunity to go to Murfreesboro, Illinois, to Elm Street Baptist Church a week ago, and share with their men. And, and I shared with them this story out of Gideon's chapter 7. Gideon is one of the judges. Now, in the Bible, when you read the book of Judges, you remember God was leading through Moses, and then through Joshua. And they, the, the children of Israel, they got tired of that, and they said, we want... We want a king. Well, before they got a king, they had judges. And judges were, in effect, the leaders. They weren't a judge like we think of today as a legal judge, although some had some legal responsibility in leading Israel. But they were just leading the children of Israel during different periods of their history. Gideon was one of those judges. They were good judges and they were bad judges. Gideon was a good judge. And, and so he's facing the Midianites, and he, he's overwhelmed by them, and he's afraid about defeating them. And, and God wants to do something through, mid, through, through Gideon, not only for the children of Israel, but for us and our Christian walk and for us as men. Gideon has 22,000 men, and they're going to take on the Midianites he want they, to be defeated, enemies of Israel. And he says, all right. He said, I want you to stand before the men of Israel and say, if you're scared, go home. And so the first crowd you have are the cowards. The Bible says that, that uh, 12,000 of those 22,000 said they were afraid and they went home. They were passive men. We find the first man, Adam, passive in the Garden of Eden. You remember when the Bible says that Adam and Eve sinned, Eve ate the fruit first. All right? But the Bible says, and, and we often think that when, when the serpent... Satan was tempting her and having this dialogue with her. All you hear about is this dialogue between Ad, uh, Eve and Satan. And you wonder, well, where's, where's Adam? And a lot of times we think that, well, he's wandering somewhere else in the garden. And the Bible says he was standing right there with her, watching it happen, and said nothing. In my opinion, the greater sin is on Adam than it is on Eve because he, 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 he assumed passivity. He went passive on his wife. In the New Testament, do they talk about Eve's sin? No, they talk about Adam's sin, the Adamic nature that we have, Adam's sin. And Adam went passive. He just stood there and watched it happen. And there are a lot of guys who are cowards in their homes because they're not leading and they've just gone passive. Then they're not assuming the responsibility to lead their families. So guys, that's one group right there, all right? 
Then you have the guy, he says, look, you got 10,000 men, that's still too many to take on the Midianites. And so, and he said, the reason I'm going to cull it down is so that I will get the glory for the win. I'm going to receive the glory. And so he says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to separate the men. Take them down to the water, and you tell the men to go drink water. And you watch the men. The men who stick their face in the water and lap water like a dog, you separate them out. And the men who go down and kneel and drink the water, then you separate them. So he takes them down and watches the men. He says, go get a drink of water. And he watches those who stick their face in the water and the other men. Those who stuck their face in the water and lapped like a dog, he said, send them home. There were only three men who knelt down. Now, why was this important? What was he showing? You had men who were careless. You were careless. They stuck their face in the water while the other guys, they knelt down and they watched and brought the water up to their mouth by their hand. And they were watching the enemy as they were drinking. The other guys were just careless. They, they were willing to fight, but they stuck their face in the water. And they positioned themselves where they're not going to see the enemy attack. That's the careless. A lot of guys want to do the right thing. They're just careless. And they're ignorant. They haven't learned how to live with understanding. That takes work to do that. But then you have the committed. The guys who not only were willing to fight, but they knew how to fight. And men, God is calling you to be a committed man. You're not going to be a perfect man in leading your family. We're going to make mistakes. God knows I've made many mistakes in my home. But God wants you, God wants me to be that committed man. I, I, I'm going to fight the fight. And some of you guys today, that's where, the, that's where the response needs to be. I've been passive in the home. I need to assume responsibility. Here's what Robert Lewis says is the definition of a man. He's a man who rejects passivity. He assumes responsibility. He leads courageously, and he waits for a greater reward. He doesn't want the reward now. He's not a boy who wants it now. He's a man who's willing to wait. I'm going to pay the price now for the great reward that I'm going to receive. That's, that's a man. That's a great definition of a man. So guys, maybe for some of you today, it means I need to reject passivity. I've been too passive in the home. For some of you guys, you're willing to fight the fight, but you don't know how. And I'm going to encourage you to be, pursue that path of learning. What does it mean for me as a man to lead my family, to live with my wife in an understanding way so that I can be that committed man, that committed man who is on point every single second of my, of my life as I'm leading my family. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? There's some of you who are here this morning and would, and would say, Pastor, I've come to understand that not only have I been passive in my home, but I've been passive with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have a relationship with God. I've been passive in my walk with Him. And, and I know that I should have a relationship with God. I've been convicted of that need, but I've not made that commitment. And today, guys, you're really not going to be able to be a committed man to your wife if you're not committed to the Lord, who will show you the plan, who will give you the power and the strength that you need to lead your family. And guys, the, the boldest thing you can do, the most courageous thing you can do, is to get up this morning and come down here and say, I want to give my heart to God. I want to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I beg of you to do that today, not because I'm asking you, but because of the conviction that God's Spirit has put in your heart. There's some of you men who would say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. I know the Lord, but I've been passive with my wife and my family. And today... You don't have to come here to the front. You might want to come and kneel for your family, pray for your family, but just where you are. Maybe today you just need to say, God, I've been convicted of the sin of passivity in my life toward my wife. I've not been treating her as somebody who is with honor. I've not tried to understand her. And today you need to make that commitment. I'm going to begin to live with her with understanding, not out of ignorance. Boy, it's a miserable place to be leading your family out of ignorance. But today, with understanding, I want to lead my wife and my kids. Some of you guys can make a fresh start. It's not too late. It's not too late. Yeah, there's some bad things that have happened. 
But God is a God who restores the years that the locust have eaten. And man, He can do, He can rebuild your marriage. It'll be so much better than what you've ever experienced, what you knew could ex- you could experience in your home if you're willing to do that today. Some of you ladies here today need to say, God, I need to be a better wife to my husband. When my wife tries to lead, I need to follow him. I need to support him. I need to encourage him. He feels so defeated, and maybe I've been a part of that by criticizing him. But if your husband starts to lead and tries to move towards you, then follow him in that. Embrace that. Because he's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to take you to a place where you both need to be in your life spiritually as he's following Jesus Christ. There might be some today who need to come and be part of our church family. This is a great place where you can learn as a family, as a a husband and wife, how to live with each other, how to build a godly home, how to lead your kids through this milestone strategy we've talked about. We want to encourage you to be a part of our church today. Others may just need to come and pray or talk with someone. God, I thank you for your truth. Lord, it's so hard sometimes to do the right thing the right way. We feel so defeated and discouraged. Satan attacks us even when we begin the commitment that you call us to. Well, Lord, I pray that we'll remember once again that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And that we'll live on that truth and that truth alone. Help these to come who need to today, all of us, as we really recommit ourselves to being the godly man, the godly woman you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.